All right, so welcome everyone to the third webinar in our project-based learning webinar series. Uh, the first webinar was our overview, right? Um, kind of the what and the why of project-based learning. Last week's session was incorporating project-based learning into STEM. And this week um, we will be talking about project-based learning and the arts um, and we have our guest presenter today, Yvonne, and I will give her a moment to introduce herself in just a second. Um, I just want to um, acknowledge that this webinar is brought to you um, in partnership between the Wisconsin After School Network and the Department of Public Instruction. And we appreciate um, all of you being here with us today. So Yvonne, I am gonna turn it over to you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Um... Like Jen said, uh, today's topic is project-based learning in the arts, or as I like to call it, how to have fun while also learning. Um, you can head to the next slide. So a little bit about me. Um, like Jen said, my name is Yvonne. Um, I'm a professional mess maker and glitter fairy, also known as an art teacher. Um, I've worked in a variety of educational settings from after school programs to teaching art in schools to teaching water ballet at a pool. Um, I am currently working at a children's museum and have been doing that for the last few years. Um, so I've sort of seen the gamut of educational settings and everything. Um, and then my email is there if you want to follow up at Anytime after this, feel free to contact me. Um, some of the topics we're gonna touch base on today, um, we'll start out with a little warm up. Um, it's something I like to do in a lot of my art classes just to kind of get us in the right creative frame of mind and loosen up our silliness. Um, then we're gonna uh, go over some of the PBL skills that are major skills that the arts teach, um, and then talk about some of or the arts in relation to other subjects. There's a lot of overlap, um, a lot of things that you can combine to create uh, longer term projects and um, some really sustained learning. Um, then we'll go over some examples and we'll wrap up with uh, some questions, comments, and, you know, how to teach art when you don't necessarily consider yourself an artist. So for our warm up, um, we're going to do blind contour drawings. Um, if you've got a scrap of paper and something to write it on, that's all you really need. Um, these are a sort of fun and silly way to uh, develop spatial awareness and a few other skills that I'll touch base on in a minute. But if you have a scrap of paper by your, your desk and a pen, that's what you need at the moment. And then you can hand on to the next slide. So we're going to spend about five minutes or so um, doing this. Uh, pick something in front of you to draw and try drawing it without looking at the paper. Um, usually I when I do this, I pair students up and have them draw each other because it's a good way to for them to get to know each other. And it adds a little extra clarity for everybody involved because they end up looking pretty silly. Um, I also do one myself when I do this because um, it's a good way to relate to the kids and kind of show them what I do and that my drawings end up similarly silly as theirs. So yeah, take a few minutes to do that and then we'll come back.
this is a easy enough project that I've done it with uh, elementary school kids and it's really fun to see like the amount of giggles that come out of it when you do it with that age. If anyone uh, cares to share their final uh, sketches, we'll do that now. Feel free to keep working if you're still drawing. Um, this is mine. I drew a book and a bottle in front of me. Um, one of the things that I do with this activity is I always do it with my students so that um, you know they can see that me as the adult and as the person with an art background doesn't have a perfect <laughs> drawing of whatever I'm trying to draw. <clears throat> That's one of the like biggest sort of takeaways about this activity is that like you're just practicing your drawing and your spatial awareness. Um, and it it's not supposed to be perfect. And um, it helps sort of students kind of rid that idea that like their end project has to be absolutely perfect. Um, and additionally, like we get some practice with drawing, the younger students get to practice holding pencils um, we learned some art specific vocabulary and it's really silly and really funny when they're drawing each other because it's just really goofy and I always give them the option of drawing me because it ends up being really silly as well. Anybody care to share their results? Sure, I'll share mine. Don't laugh too hard. <laughs> so this is my coffee cup. It's a coffee cup that has a cow on it. It says, I just freaking love cows. And so uh, uh, I thought maybe I would get the wording right. So I think I got pretty much right there. But obviously, it's off, off kilter. And then what's behind it? So I think that was a stapler, or a paper clip, a couple pages in or papers in front. Um, I have a frame of my daughter's photo and, uh, so yeah, this is it. It was really difficult not to look down. I love the exercise. Thank you. Anyone else? I saw you on mute, Dolly. You going to share? Oh, I don't know if you can see it very well. See what this is? It's this salt shaker. I didn't get all the connections right, but I got the basic outline. It was fun. Yep. And like I said, this is just a way to practice our drawing skills and our spatial awareness and um, the end results are never perfect and it's, especially with younger kids, like elementary level, a good way to get kind of the giggles going and 
help them sort of think outside of the box. Looks like Nicole's trying to share hers. Nicole, can you unmute? Hmm. I think her drawing is behind. Okay, sorry. I'm, I'm connected over this. Bluetooth this time, so. But yeah, definitely shows <laughs> that it's not as easy as you would think it would be. One of the other things I like um, doing with this activity is if I see a kid peeking at the paper, sort of jokingly tell him, stop cheating. And making it abundantly clear that like, I'm just teasing them and everything. And that also gets some giggles out of them. Anybody else want to share? It's totally fine if you don't want to, too. Um, so the next thing we're going to go over are some uh, skills that are heavy things we teach in art classes and music, theater, all of the arts that uh, overlap with uh, skills that uh, PBL tries to teach as well. Um, one of the big things we do is give students exposure to playing different instruments, different materials, um, different ways of expressing. Uh, kids get to try a lot of new things in the arts classes and, you know, stuff that they wouldn't necessarily get to try in art other classes, um, self-expression, creativity, body and spatial awareness, problem solving and critical thinking, finding gross motor skills, um, that things can be done in multiple ways and that people have different perspectives, um, you know, and trying to be able to understand other people's perspectives um, and empathy. Uh, you know, like there are a lot of life skills that the arts teach while we're doing art or playing music. Um, there's a lot of coordination that goes on. Um, so there's a lot of like life skills that, you know, like are our primary focus. The next slide. Um, and then on top of that, we can take the arts and overlap them with other subjects. Art can help teach geometry, physics, engineering, technology, um, color theory, and like the science behind that. Um, music helps uh, students understand fractions and other math concepts, um, as well as physics. Um, Theater can help improve literacy skills and, you know, gross motor uh, skills. Um, dance, dance teaches students how to control their body. It's great exercise, helps with um, the gross motor skills. And then all of the arts can help teach uh, history, social studies, teamwork, coordination about other cultures. Um, and... Yeah, a lot of these uh, um, sort of overlaps um, are also things that I experienced when I was sort of growing up and going through the school system myself. Um, a class I took in college um, was called Physics in the Arts, and it was specifically designed for, you know, non-physics majors that need the science credit, but we talked about like the physics behind cameras, the physics behind uh, color theory, both with regards to light and paint mixing. We spent half the semester talking about the physics of mus musical instruments and 
the difference between the physics of like a flute versus a stringed instrument. Um, theater classes at my high school were English credits because they were, you know, like so heavy on the reading and the writing. Um, dance was a gym credit. So there's there's a lot of overlap that you can do to help teach multiple subjects and get some of the like academic uh, standards that you have to sort of go over. You know, this is the art teacher coming out, but like you can still go over a lot of the academic topics while also doing it in a art enrichment way that can be tailored to the student interest can focus on real world problems and things that are applicable to students uh, daily lives and can contain or cater to sustained learning. And it helps make good connections too. I, I put a comment in the chat, Yvonne, that it really makes me think of the very first webinar when we talked about like the idea of enrichment, academic enrichment, and not more school after school, but finding new and fun and different engaging ways for kids to practice. And I, this list is just an exhaustive example of how we can really be creative in our spaces and still reinforce literacy skills and math while having fun and being creative. Um, some professional development I did uh, while I was teaching in a school involved um, learning how to sort of teach literacy in subjects outside of like the reading classroom or the like ELA English classroom. Um, they were really big on, <laughs> excuse me, teaching like content specific words. So things like contour is teaching art specific concepts while also helping build literacy skills. Um, and on a similar note, I've had a handful of students um, over the years that really struggled in their traditionally academic classes, but then were doing really well in music or the arts. I had one student that was literally like failing all of his academic classes simply because he didn't show up. But then the two classes he regularly came to were his tech ed class and art. And, you know, like, I'm a firm believer in using the arts and like other like hands-on activities to kind of reinforce some of that academic learning and you know, like you can do both at the same time. Um, the arts by nature are project-based learning. Um, one thing you should be careful about um, is not doing an art project. Um, this is a big thing that was reinforced when I was learning to be an art teacher um, is the difference between like an art project and an art lesson, a project being something that's much more prescriptive, you know, think doing a Mother's Day project where all students are doing like the exact same thing, the exact same way, you know, there's very little room for, you know, creativity and for students to add their own flair, you know, everybody does their own or like does the same thing. And the end result looks very similar from one student to the next. An art lesson is more focused on the technique and the process. And um, the image here is a painting I did um, that kind of helps illustrate that. Um, I did a study abroad program in Italy when I was in college um, and the art class I took was on-site painting. So we would go to various locations around Florence and paint what was in front of us. Um, this image is from one of the suburbs of Florence looking 
into Florence and the, the skyline and all the students in my class were looking at the same image, but we all ended up with very different results. And, you know, like you want to try to have similar sort of process when you're teaching lessons and stuff so that it's more about the uh, process and less about the end result. Um, and that students have the flexibility to interpret what they see, you know, their own way. Um, and it makes for a, a cool opportunity to sort of share out and reinforce that everybody's got different ways of seeing. Um, additionally, um, the arts can be used to, like you can build upon skills learning uh, that you learned earlier in the year. Um, there's a few instances where we might do something that's more of a short term project to learn some basic techniques, but then we can build upon those later in the year to develop more um, sustained projects and, you know, help make connections and everything. Uh, and then one of my favorite things about, um, like, specifically visual arts um, that I love is that a lot of projects you give kids have a fair amount of choice just built in with them. Um, you know, I have taught some high school students um, and like particularly once you get to that level, like they've developed enough of the skills on their own that like you're focusing on the skills you're teaching them and then you give them a few parameters and they all are able to sort of infuse their own ideas and their own preferences into the project. Um, one of the projects I did while I was student teaching was uh, having students make uh, little pins and badges uh, in metal. And, you know, like the main requirement is that, was that they used a few different techniques that I'd shown them and that it was a wearable piece of art. Uh, but other than that, as long as it was school appropriate, like they had free reign to make what they want. And, you know, it, it's just so rewarding to be able to see kids get invested in their project because they can make something that's really personal to the, to that. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some examples um some of the stuff that i have listed is stuff that i've done some of it is things i kind of came up with just while i was making this powerpoint um one of the big things that i've uh done is given um students recycling materials um just giving them an array of materials and kind of letting them have at it. Uh, when I was teaching an after school program, um, I gave students a handful of cardboard boxes and literally told them to make anything they wanted as long as it was school appropriate. Um, they ended up making a castle. And there was a group about of about five or six of them that spent about a week, week and a half working on this castle for the better part of program and you know like it kept them occupied for a few hours a day for a week and a half um they got to decorate it they got to build it um i was mostly there to help answer questions if they came up or give pieces of advice be an extra set of hands if they needed them and through this whole process they're you know, they got to pick what they made. They got to figure out and problem solve how to build it and practice their engineering skills by trying to build it. Um, they were in complete control of what they were making. They got to practice their teamwork skills by working with each other and figuring out who was going to take point on what part of the project. Uh, 
And then they were working on their creativity and they got really invested in decorating their castle and very excited to show their parents when their parents would come pick them up. Um, I've also done block challenges uh, where I tell them to make a stadium or some other structure, scene, whatever, and you know, they get as much time as they want to uh, build it. They have to figure out what they, you know, need to do to make sure it's structurally sound. They got to work things out with some of the other kids that might want to knock it down. Um, and a lot of times they're very proud of, like, with their end results. Um, it's a good opportunity to take some pictures to, like... You know, so I mean, you've got the permissions and everything to share with parents and everything, um, especially if it's something that might get do knocked down easily. Like, it's a good way to give the students an opportunity to like brag to their parents about what they did in after school. Um, another project you can do is create a children's book um, and have them plan what the story is going to be about, write it, illustrate it. Um, you know, sort of build the book. Um, and again, it they can choose what they want to uh, have it be about. They can work as a team to de uh, delegate roles and who wants to focus on writing, who might want to focus on the drawing. And then you can read it to younger students or read it to kindergarten classes at the school and you know, practice your literacy skills. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have family nights in your programs. And so you can plan for performances and art shows and other sorts of things uh, for your family nights and get the kids involved in the planning of that and have them help set up and again works on some of these problem solving and critical thinking skills and you know helps them think ahead and think of what they might need and is something that just by nature is going to be a sustained project um, another example of something i had in one of my programs um, was a student who was really into writing, um, wanted to write a play and perform it uh, for the rest of our after school program and recruited a few other kids to help him. And he was going to write it and they were going to perform it all together. And, you know, this was something the kid just kind of started doing on his own. Um, he had a huge interest in writing and we just encouraged it and again we're there to help with questions if they had one um you know he would sometimes come to us to ask how to spell something so we were there to help when he had a question and then we just kind of keep encouraging it or kept encouraging it when they were working on it and um ultimately they kind of did a quickie performance of it and you know had a squirrel moment and kind of moved on to the next thing but it was you know kind of cool to see them kind of initiated on its own and um that's a, sort of another thing I am on the lookout when I'm teaching is just the student interest when the student in initiates a project like this and just encouraging it they're they're going to learn so much just by the process of doing it. Can I just tag on that for a second, Yvonne? I don't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> your your um, presentation, uh, but we had a similar experience with a group of kids in our after school program who were very into like performance and drama. And they were elementary kids. They didn't really have many opportunities or other outlets. And so we started a drama club 
in our after school program, very similar to what you were just talking about. I think it was initiated by the interest of the kids. They started by reading some simple plays and just kind of performing for each other and then started thinking about what would we want a play to be about and brainstorming, do we want a message and who do we want the characters? And uh, they went to uh, a local thrift shop with a, a little bit of seed money and they bought some clothes for costumes and then they put on their play at a parent night for our program. And it was a group of about six or eight elementary kids who basically wrote and produced this, this whole, you know, little dramatic performance and the amount of teamwork and learning and writing and reading that went into that whole process was pretty amazing. Yeah. The um, group I was working with, uh, with the kid that was writing, very interested in writing were uh, kindergarten to second graders. And a particular kid that started this was in first grade. And, you know, it's, so empowering for them when they have this thing that they want to try to do and like your response is yes absolutely let's do it and you know like again like I want them to be interested in in learning and have fun while doing it and one of the things I love about the arts in general is that like drawing painting playing music dance performing these are all things that the kids do for fun outside of school you know like you know they play a lot outside of school and there's so much learning that can be done with these things that they do naturally on their own outside of school and so many opportunities to sort of incorporate life skills academic skills, ap academic concepts into it. And like, they don't really even realize that they're learning things. School can be fun. Yvonne, and this goes on what Jen was talking about too. It seems to me the key to making it really successful and effective is helping teach them some basic skills that will make them more effective in that. And so I saw a parallel when you were talking about sort of learning the art skills like the contour drawing as an example or other basic art skills. And once they've got those really basic skills, then they're gonna be more successful in their project. And a lot of times they're learning those basic skills in the classroom. So you don't have to, you know, spend a lot of time on them. But the, the same was true for STEM. And I just saw a real parallel there. Because when we did STEM last week, we talked about, you know, those basic skills of, of a scientist asking questions, um, looking for uh, collecting data, um, using evidence. And so you're going to have a better science project if you learn some of those basic skills. And so I think just the same is true. And even with your kids developing their own play and, you know, you were talking about, let's look at the elements of a good story. What do you need to have in order to have a good story? And what, you know, let's look at some existing plays and what makes them good and what makes them not so good. And what do we want ours to be? So, you know, thinking more deeply, it's, I think it's a bridge between just letting them go on their own and they can do something. It might not be as interesting or as meaningful as if they get, you help them build a foundation and some skills to do it really well. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, the some of the examples I sort of gave here, you know, were within the confines of an after-school program. Um, and this kind of goes to your question, Nancy. Um, you know, it is very much finding that balance between, like, giving them to, the room to, or some room to figure it out and teaching them those basic skills. Um You know, some of these things were sort of low time consuming things that like you could give them the materials and just kind of tell them go. Um, in the case of the, the castle building, 
you know, some of them might have had an experience like that before. So they had at least some idea of like where to go. Um, and, you know, I generally just try to make sure I'm aware of like what they're doing so that like I can make myself available to them while also like making sure that the rest of program is going smoothly and snack is out and everything. Um, and sort of finding that fine line between, you know, needing to teach them something and giving them the room to, to practice. Um, in a lot of my like art classes, um, we start out by like spending 10, 20 minutes learning a new skill. And then the rest of class is an opportunity for them to, to practice that and work on a project. And then we might spend, you know, a few days to a couple of weeks working on like the same project and practicing those skills. Um, yeah. So Nancy, do you, uh, her question in the chat was uh, about staff and feeling like it's hard to have a small group of kids going off and doing a special project. Um, and she was asking if we have any suggestions on how to navigate. Um, and I think a piece of that was answered in that, you know, it's partly adult led, but the kids have more autonomy. So the adult doesn't have to be they're leading the whole process. If you have kids, you know, maybe um, in a shared space, depending upon what your program looks like, right? Everybody has kind of a different physical environment. If you're a cafeteria library, if you're in a dedicated space, um, but, you know, kids could maybe be doing more choice activities. And this group of kids who are interested in this special project could be choosing that you know, during that choice time where the adults are more broadly supervising the group because those activities don't require the same level of adults. Can I interject something for a second? Yeah, absolutely, Nancy, please. I was going to say, five, 10 years ago, I would have grabbed upon this and, and did it without thinking. Now I find the behaviors of the children are so hard to regulate at many times that putting six to nine and not having someone right there, you have chaos pretty soon, especially kindergarten, first second grade. Uh, and like I said, I, I really see the, the, the social skills of our children have become so hard to regulate at times that it's nerve wracking to, because I love to do these kind of things. I just absolutely, we do a reader's theater, but we have to do it all as a first grade and divide them into groups. But everybody's got to kind of be doing the same thing. Otherwise, we we find, and I don't know if anybody else is coming across this, we find that the behaviors are just um, very challenging the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Is it absolutely a fair concern. Yeah, and I don't think you're alone in that, Nancy. I've heard that um, from a variety of programs, right? That that has kind of been um, one of the more challenging aspects of the last couple of years, kind of coming out of the pandemic. I think, it, you know, there's probably lots of reasons, but kids not having the same routines and access um, to consistent experiences with adults and peers just because of all of what happened, um, I think we're seeing deficits in those skills, right? And kids are really having to kind of learn those at a later stage than they would have if that hadn't been disrupted. And so maybe these are, you know, projects or this idea of project-based learning is something that gets incorporated later in the year. If you, you know, get to a point where you feel like you spend the first part of the year really focusing on more of those uh, social and emotional skills and really kind of getting kids to a place where they can navigate and and handle some of these smaller kind of projects in with a little bit more autonomy. But I think and that's the a school very who sponsors concern. us, the school that sponsors us is a project based school. So I'm <laughs> all for this. And I'm all for doing exactly what you're talking about. I just wondered if there's any suggestions, because it just seems like when you're trying things, and I think Jennifer is right, you have to sometimes 
delay it till like February or March when you feel that you have the children, the same children, and you've kind of got a handle on knowing their personalities. I mean, one of the main ways I've sort of dealt with some of the behaviors is just establishing a positive relationship with the kids. And, um, you know, that this may, like you said, may be something that like you focus on a little bit at the beginning, you're learning those skills. And then later you can do a project that's building off some of those skills. Um, but again, like you're not alone, um, just working in the museum setting. I've seen a lot of kids that are struggling with things like sharing and interacting with peers um, at, and struggling with some of those skills at a later age than what I had been seeing before. So like it's happening across the board. Um, fewer examples um, of stuff I've done. Um, I've made paint with kids. Um, in the context of how I've done it, it's usually like a couple day project, maybe a day. Um, but it's absolutely something that can be extended out into a longer uh, project. Um, but I give them a little bit of the historical context about how people used to make paint and then give them some materials to use. Uh, we go outside, they can find plants to use um, and just mix things together to see what works well, what doesn't work well um, to make some paint. And then I always give them an opportunity to like test their paint out um, and paint some pictures. And it's kind of cool to see what colors they come up with and um, how surprised they are when, you know, blueberries make more of a purple color than blue. Um, and, you know, it it's science, you get some history, you get experimentation, problem solving, they can, make hypothesis it sees to see what the colors they think they're going to come up with and what they think is going to work well um uh sort of along with that one of the words sort of words that has come up a lot recently um is steam so it's building on stem but they just insert art in there um and then you can also do a craft fair um you know, longer sustained learning. Um, you can have the kids help with the planning, the creating of the crafts you want to sell or make, who they want the audience to be. Um, if it's something you're going to sell, you can have them, them decide how they want to use the money, whether they donate it or use it for a special after school related thing, but definitely brings in the arts with a few different other uh, fields that they can practice something start to finish. Uh, here are a few additional resources. Um, the first two links are more information about how arts PBL works. And then the second one is a few more examples of um, how you, of PBL lessons with the, the arts. Uh, any other questions for anybody? Um, and then in my little PSA here at the end is, you know, I know I'm an artist and have the, the art background, but that shouldn't stop you from trying to incorporate the arts into your program. Um, like with the contour drawings we did at the start, like, it's okay if it's not perfect. You can learn with the kids. Um, that's going to help develop some relationships with them. And, you know, 
they love being able to see their teachers learning with them. Um, and practice makes perfect. Any questions or comments, anyone? I'd love to hear from the rest of you just about what other, if you hear, th think of other barriers or um, does this sound like something you could try to incorporate even in small steps or are there other barriers to doing th this kind of learning, either the arts or STEM or whatever? Um, we have one more session next week, the partnership session, and we really want to try to address some of your concerns and um, maybe make sure that we've complete the circle and, and give you what you need to do project-based learning. Um, one thing I thought of with Nancy's question about, you know, being lack of staff, um, not that volunteers can ever replace staff. I don't think that's possible, but there are ways to get other volunteers and other warm bodies <laughs> into your program, um, some of which might have the expertise that would help with these projects. And we'll talk about that more next week. Um, but we'd really like to hear from you in term, either in the chat or if you wanna unmute, um, what you think and what more you need in order to be able to do this. Along with that, Dolly, um, there was one point when I was in an after school program where I brought my dad into, he was a wildlife biologist and so he, brought some things in to show the kids from what he did for his job. And, you know, that's an extra adult in the room that can lead the activity while you focus on more of the behavior stuff and, you know, getting snack ready and all the other things you have to worry about. Right. And there are people out there that are looking for a way to help in education and don't necessarily have a way to do that. And so um, I think identifying your needs and what could help you in your program could go a long way. So I will leave space uh, for people to ask questions, but in the meantime, I'm also going to launch our poll. If everyone would take just a minute to complete our five question um, survey, we would very much appreciate that. And if you wanna continue um, the conversation or asking questions, um, you can certainly do that while this poll is in play, but I wanna do that, um, capture it before people leave our session today. 